Hello, how are you guys? How's everybody? Good? Let's give a big round of applause to all the speakers, the conference, Apollo, it's great, great. It's gonna be hard to top them, but try my best. So we're gonna start off with a quick question. And I'm assuming you're all engineers mostly, right? A couple product people maybe sipped into the conference. <laughs> so how many of you have had a CEO tell you, hey, this tech looks really cool, let's use it? Show of hands, <laughs> everybody's like, God, no. Um, sorry, that was me actually in 2019, about three months before our very first enterprise launch. So you can imagine my team was not happy. And our team was also distributed across LA, San Francisco, New York, Brasov, which is in Romania, and Kiev, Ukraine. Um, little time juggle there. So our engineers were not happy with my shiny new object called GraphQL. Um, really quick background on our, on our company, our origin story in a way. We started off with Meteor. Sorry for the sad face, Matt, wherever you are. Um, it was our MVP, it was good enough. Uh, we then moved over to modernizing a little bit with React. We were already part of MongoDB. I mean, we were using MongoDB, so we just kept that in the stack. Eventually implemented our very first monolith, which was our, obviously the first move with most companies that, that move into GraphQL. And now we're at this beautiful federation stage uh, that we're very happy to be in. Um, so three months from enterprise deploy, your CEO changes everything, what do you do? resignation letters, open for work on LinkedIn. Everybody was pissed off at me, basically. Um, they were pretty upset until I took this thing off and said, you know what? No, I'm gonna stop posting as a CEO and uh, put on my hoodie. And I started coding with them. So I'm actually an engineer, software engineer, and that changed the entire dynamic of my team we started to actually work together on this massive initiative that we had, which seemed impossible, but we pulled it off. Um, that's my team there, my beautiful team in Ukraine. Well, that was our team in Ukraine, and now they're in Poland. Um, and you know, we, we really bonded as a family, I would say, as we started to do this. Um, now, three months after rocking it every single night, <laughs> um, tons of Georgian food, ungodly amounts of Red Bull, we pulled it off, we launched. Uh, but then came the most hard part, or the, really the hardest part of any kind of initiative like this, it's enterprise customer adoption, which we'll talk more about later. Now, what is in recovery? <laughs> How much coffee did you have? I don't drink coffee, but um, that's just natural energy level. So my origin story, my background, I started coding at a, about eight years old. That's a Commodore 64 right there, if you guys can see it. Um, yeah. You guys just all revealed your age. <laughs> And I really started coding to avoid bullying, but this was the internet before the internet. This, this is a bulletin board um, back in, that's actually, it was located in San Diego. And you can see a little thing down there. It says, no, you only have two more calls allowed for today. So you had to dial into these servers and they would let you typically download more, you know, <laughs> unlicensed software typically, or if you were more in my end of the spectrum, software cracks and un, unsavory things. Um, and I had, as a result of being a big tech nerd, I had two exits by 27, uh, but then I became extremely addicted to drugs, unfortunately, um, went from having a really good life to being homeless. I was one of those people on the streets that you see that you typically disregard because they just seem like you know, some loser. Um, and that really was a major, major change for me, um, humbled me up a lot, and I rebuilt myself, but I remained heavily addicted to cocaine for many, many years. I was one of those functional cocaine addicts of New York, which unfortunately we have way too many of. Um, February 2016, I can't even, it, it's happened so long ago, I still get a knot in my throat. My best friend overdosed, um, Jay Greenwald. He was the founder of Daytran Media, amazing tech entrepreneur, great tech investor. We lost him for no reason. And so I checked myself into rehab and that's where I had the vision for my current company, which is to really drive the patient experience, the clinician experience in a much more, in a, in a different way, in a data-driven way, to really enable personalization of care and do awesome things that typically, all of us, that, there's a couple of people in healthcare here, you'll understand this, it's, it's really horrible how we treat people when it comes to software in that space, it's, it's really bad. Um, and why does this all matter? Why are you telling us all this? So the underlying tone of this talk is humanizing tech. How can you use 
GraphQL or any technology for that matter to bring teams together, to bring stakeholders together, to make the process more human. So proud teams, harmony between engineering and product that actually happens. It's very, very doable. I'll show you how we did it. And very highly engaged customers. Um, and now you guys are probably thinking, this guy's definitely not sober, right? Um, so really, but it truly is possible. And some of the ways that we did it internally with our own team, for example, we had, this is our team uh, on a Zoom call with these Met Talks that we used to do. And we would teach our engineers, our designers, our product people about what they are working on at a deep level. Those are our doctors that are on staff, Dr. Kripke, Dr. Faruqi, and they would teach them about the subject matter that they're building products around. And that would all, again, it would change things so much because we would suddenly see that little feature that we're building actually has a purpose behind it. And I challenge you all to think about your own companies when you talk to your customers, when you talk to your actual end users, how that is also relevant. How when you start to understand how that's affecting their life, it makes a major difference in your motivation and your passion for what you're building and so on. And this is not so happy, but also a great thing. We, the war in Ukraine obviously started last year and I flew out there as a leader of a company that has a team in Ukraine, I could not stay back here in beautiful California and call myself their CEO. So I flew out there, ended up staying about four months there. We did a lot of humanitarian work. We helped a lot of families. Those are some kids that were um, relocated with their moms and stayed as a unit, as a family, because it was very important. What happened there was a real atrocity. And it really helped us bond. And so let's get back to GraphQL. So the graph shows up in an organization in many ways. Just like a financial model for me, as a founder, as a CEO, it tells my story in Excel. It's something that I never respected. I never, I looked at a financial model, like, why, why do I need this? Until I finally was forced to build one. One of my advisors forced me to actually build my own financial model in Excel, which is not my domain, I, that's not my thing. But it was great when I finally understood what it is doing. It's helping me understand my business story in numbers, and that was, Pretty groundbreaking in, in the way that my mindset shifted. And the graph tells your business story and can actually get people talking. And what that does is that it forces you to kind of shift away from the solutions thinking to modeling the problem, not just the tech solution. And that kind of goes back to a little bit of the product side with design thinking, but it really makes a major difference when you stop thinking about, okay, this stack or this server, it's all irrelevant at the end of the day. Let's look at a little bit deeper, what are we trying to solve? What's the problem we're trying to address? Um, and really stealing this from yesterday's keynote, leading with stories. Um, so GraphQL, it can help you reach your organizational goals in a strategic way. And I'm gonna show you a couple of demos of how we do it within my company. So this is a request engine we're gonna look at now. Um, the stakeholders are clinicians, logistics staff, patients, family members. And by bringing these stakeholders to the table while we were developing this product, it changed a lot of things for us. We started to understand what the actual real needs of them were. Um, you can see the planning time there was about two and a half months, mostly because we had to do a lot of interviews and we're dealing with doctors, with nurses, with people that have very, very busy schedules. So it took a little bit longer to actually get them on the table uh, in a meeting, but uh, the build time was fast, about three weeks. This is what they went from. We're gonna show a lot of Miro slides here because we use Miro aggressively in my company. I would say aggressively is an, under, an understa understatement. Um, that's a PDF that is fillable. It's a fillable PDF. That's the way an entire hospital was forcing their patients to submit information for requests. And obviously if you're in treatment, you're in rehab, you're not in the best state Mentally, you're still kind of coming back to reality, having to do this, and then they would take this, print it, scan it, and then have someone do data entry in Excel to deal with requests. That's that's healthcare for you. <laughs> um, there there were no there was no faxing here, but I was surprised there wasn't because they actually use faxes. <laughs> I hear some people laughing back there from Ascension. <laughs> yes. Anyway, so this is how we model things. So our product people working with developers. You see the type definitions down there for GraphQL. That's our product designer working next to our developers, modeling the problem that they're trying to solve. 
instead of trying to solve it with tech first, or with tech first. Um, that's what ended up becoming the panel that's being used for transport requests. We build a whole app around the actual end user. It created a whole ecosystem of collaboration, which was really, really cool to see. Because you're typically, I'm a software engineer, so I get it. But I also love products, so I kind of always force people to work together. But you don't want people touching your domain, for the most part. And anyway, and this is a really cool thing. And I'm going to stop here for a moment, because this is, I know Dan was really adamant about me showing this one. This is a designer building a state machine, an actual graphic designer working on a state machine to communicate in our language as software engineers what they need us to do. Now, this took a lot to, to, to push. Uh, and that's why there's a bunch of emojis, and it's fun. But it really helped visualize for a designer, what we would then come to them with like, oh, so what do we do in this state? And what do we do when this happens? So they started to think in a more similar way as we do as software engineers. And it, it changed things a lot. And, and eventually, when, they got, when this clicked, they were like, oh my god, this is awesome. What's next? What else do you have? Throw some more stuff at us. Throw some more tech stuff at us. So it changed the dynamic. Again, going back to humanizing your process. Um, this is our actual GraphQL strategy, and I'm putting this, or our, our actual GraphQL uh, uh, schema here, but our, I'm putting this in the slide because if you see down there, you can see the actual business model, which is this request engine, and you can see it wrapping around the type definition, so, and, and around the schema. So it really shows how you can use GraphQL again to truly bring together these teams. The survey engine's a really fun one. This took about two and a half months. Also, again, because we had to deal with clinicians, their schedules, and so on. Could have probably cut that down to about a week of planning and about a week of build out. Um, this is a really fun one we, because we, we're dealing with assessments. So I'm going to give you some background about how assessments are typically done in healthcare. They are typically, uh, well, they used to be, sometimes it still is, a paper form that you fill out. They are clinically validated assessments that have been developed long ago. Uh, that one's built by, I think, uh, Dr. Robert Splinter from uh, Columbia University. That's the GAD7. It's, it's an anxiety assessment. I think that was built in the 70s or in the 80s with this research. This assessment is, I think, well, it's seven questions, but it's typically collected in such a not intuitive way that people just fill it out. Okay, get this out of my way. Like, I don't want to deal with this. So we built it in a, in a more interactive way. We also built in into our whole system. Uh, something called factor analysis. So if you all, anyone that knows statistics or, or biostatistics, it basically helps us shrink the amount of questions we have to ask and still get the same result, statistically valid result. Um, so here's the MERT engine, the MIRT engine that we're talking about, and this is the actual schema. Um, and we collaborate on Miro with the schema as it evolves. We don't have it coming in in real time from, from, from Apollo, but may, that, that might be a cool plugin for Miro in the future. Um, but oh, and this is funny. This is why the CEO shouldn't code. So at the end of the day, we had this massive recursion engine, and I just wasn't happy with it. I was like, why are we doing this? Why am I storing arrays to like 50 levels? And so I took a nap. I couldn't solve it, and I was like, I'm sick of this. And then I woke up, and I was like, oh my god, this is just a directed graph. And so this is how we implemented our survey engine, and now we have a and then of one uh, lookup, so it's awesome because we, we, we are super, super fast when it comes to, to accessing that information. This permission system is not an actual subgraph. It's on our data layer, but it's really cool because this was actually a weekend hack. It took us about a weekend to implement this. Planning was about three months, again, because we had clinicians, IT, uh, hospital IT is <laughs> something else, um, and compliance, which is another stakeholder that you never really want to talk to, but you should. Legal and compliance are so important when it comes to healthcare. And if you don't listen to them, you will listen to them once a problem arises. And once a problem arises typically means a couple million dollars of legal fees and, and typically a lawsuit and so on. So you don't want to do that. Um, so we built this system so, so heavy that every single request in our engine or in our platform took about 250 milliseconds to sometimes 600 milliseconds, depending on how busy the the platform was uh, to validate uh, authorization. And so I brought that down to about 0.008, uh, which was pretty solid uh, improvement. Again, it was just this very procedural code base that had, I think, a, an exponential 
time complexity. It was just pretty bad. Um, and so we built out this entire engine <clears throat> that really focused on you know, modeling, again, the data structure in a way that would actually help us a lot more. Um, we didn't use OPA, but we did bring in a couple of different access policy uh, frameworks that we just kind of borrowed stuff from. Eventually, we will go to an open source standard that will then make interoperability with our system much better. Uh, but this implementation was great. It really helped us move things forward in a much, much better way, uh, much more uh, performance, I would say. Um, and then when you see any emojis with middle fingers, that typically means I did it. <laughs> so that's a deny or an allow. It's a very basic decision, yes or no, uh, to let you through. But the engine behind it, the evaluator, it's pretty awesome because we actually have a, we build out an entire map, um, uh, uh, an actual data structure of a map so that we can access permissions at any given point in a session really, really quickly without having to query the database every single time. If there is a change in the database, we have a subscription that pushes, it hits the evaluate, the, the preprocessor, sorry, to reprocess the permissions, regenerate a map, so, and the user never sees that. They can just keep doing their job, which is typically a doctor or a clinician or a nurse, and they don't have to ever really think about revalidating their permissions. Um, anyway, again, addressing human needs. And how do we then, I'm gonna go back to what I was talking about with this deployment and how we made our customers happy. How do we embed non-technical people into the process, right? So that's a very, very hard one. And if any of you are in enterprise software, you understand that very well. A lot of times, technology is pushed upon a user, someone that is comfortable in their job, they don't wanna deal with your tech, shiny object thing. They just wanna do their job, go home to their kids, call it a day. So how do we make this happen? So we involve them in the entire development process by doing this. So we have these workshops with them. That's an actual development calendar that is used with a client. Um, it actually pulls in data from Jira. It's not real time, but we model it and make it look pretty for them to understand it and make it a little bit easier for, the, for them to digest and understand what, we, what we're going through with their request. When they request that little feature there, we have to do all these things for it to happen. And that also changes the, the dynamic because then doctors are like, oh, maybe, maybe we can do it without that. Maybe we can do it this way. And they start to be on your side, <laughs> which is really nice. Massive feedback engine at that point because we have these weekly calls with them. Um, can we link other members are asking us? Can we prioritize the family draft? So we, we listen to them, but we also have a very healthy relationship with them where we can say, you know what, that's a little bit too much. How can we solve the problem without thinking about, we want it in this way with this solution, right? So again, going back to that problem first, solution later. Anyway, I'll, I'll skip through some of these, but this is uh, really interesting how we do these, these things. So this is the usability piece. If you see the second line there, that's about 10 to 30 seconds, or really three clicks in this way, in this case. We time our UIs. And if anybody's in healthcare tech, you'll understand that an EMR does not care for your time or your disability or your mental health for that matter. Um, that doesn't exist in healthcare. So we are, <laughs> I see some people laughing back there. Yeah, I mean, it really is very, it's that bad. So we time things, we make sure that everything that they do that's on that screen is intentional and that it's something that's gonna help them solve their problem. Even though we might have some really deep, awesome tech behind it, there might be even machine learning behind this, and there actually is a lot of machine learning behind a lot of this engine. They never see it. It's all hidden in this beautifully wrapped UI, and it makes their life easier. That's the whole point of what we, we develop software to make people's lives better. Um, we'll get to that in, in a minute as well. These are the notes. This is another, another example of how we deploy and so on. So clinician engagement, we also have this launchpad newsletter. So we... We ended up seeing that a lot more people were interested in these weekly meetups that we had with our, with our providers. Providers are typically hospitals, clinics, and so on. And so we decided to do an entire newsletter that would go up to the whole organization. And that built a lot more interest in, in, the, in the tech solution that we're building as well. So our deployment not only was smoother, we started having a lot more horizontal growth opportunities for our salespeople. So then we can bring in, let's say, a salesperson to talk to this new department that found out about this through these uh, weekly meetups, and they're thinking, hey, what, can we do this in my department? Can we, can we solve this problem as well? So it really you know, creates this whole cycle that is just super, super healthy. 
Um, obviously, there's always fallbacks. It's not all perfect and rosy, but we tried our best to make it as, 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 uh, as smooth as possible. Um, and then anyway, follow up. So again, there's Jira tickets literally integrated into the, into the call. They, when you have clinicians asking about the Jira ticket, that's just life is complete at that point. <laughs> anyway, so, and we wrap it up always with a positive thing. That was Matthew, he was, or Matt, Maddie, he was our CTO's, uh, or is our CTO's, uh, former CTO's uh, newest born. And that was Emma, our, our little dog from the office. Um, so I'm going to stop right there and I'm going to ask you guys, <laughs> Uri's like, don't pick me again, <laughs> like last time at comp. Anyway, so how can you engage and humanize your process with, with GraphQL? Think about it in your own space. So I'm going to pick on someone. If you don't raise your hand, does anybody want to come up to the stage and, and explain how they engage and humanize their process with GraphQL? their software development process or product development process. Okay, Mike. <laughs> An introvert. <laughs> Come up. This is Mike Cohen, everybody. This was totally not at all planned, so I have no <laughs> idea what I'm gonna say. How do I humanize? Yeah, so at Indeed, so you work at Indeed. Mm -hmm. you know, he's part of the champions group, but GraphQL champions group. Yeah. Love this guy. But we didn't, we didn't script this. So. We did not. Yes, we really did not. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you engage within your own organization, mm -hmm. your stakeholders? And how does GraphQL plug into that picture? Yeah, so we're, we're a platform team. A little so the way, the way that we engage other teams, uh, we're, we're helping teams who build GraphQL APIs. So right. We're often, um, you know, we're, we're helping customers in Slack very often. Um, we're engaging in actually design reviews sometimes, helping them with schema. Love it. Um, how else? <laughs> sometimes dealing with hard problems. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, if we break things, we're, we're, we're often helping our customers um, with the fallout. Right. And a lot of times, I mean, you're kind of solving their, you're, you're again, solving their problems. You're, you're going deeper with them to kind of understand, mm -hmm. hey, what, what, what is it that you're actually struggling with, right? Versus, yeah, absolutely. Oh, I heard about this solution. Can we use that? Or can we use this tech, right? Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. yeah. Love it. Thank you, Mike. This is great. <laughs> so, again, takeaways from this. Um, don't be afraid. You did great, by the way, Mike. Um, let's, give, yeah, let's give Mike a round of applause. <laughs> Takeaways of that. So don't be afraid. You know, really, by modeling at the GraphQL layer, you can move up much faster. You can iterate faster. You can learn a lot faster. And that's really, really valuable. That's what we do at startups. We, we move fast. We iterate. We, we're, we're not perfect from the start. And the same thing with you guys. You guys can use GraphQL for, for that. Uh, the other thing is that it's better together. <laughs> Believe it or not, talking to your users is so important. If you talk to your end users, you will learn so much. And you will really appreciate what you're building. You'll, you'll get to another level of, of excitement when you get to work, when you talk to your end users. I know you're engineers, and that doesn't always happen. But push your product people to include you on that call, or maybe push for you to actually talk to, 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 to these customers directly. You know, ask them questions. How's, how's the experience? Or maybe read the reviews. It's, it's so rewarding when you see something that you built, and you hear from the customer God, that really helped me. Whatever they're doing, it's super cool. And empathy first. So building with empathy, that's something that, again, it goes back to this design thinking process, focusing on the human problem, not the solution. And by doing that, you go deeper and deeper and deeper to abstract the core insight. You ask the whys, that, 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 that five levels of why, I believe is what they call it, right? And it's happiness is a KPI. And if, I don't know if you remember that. That was actually, that's what we, when, when, when we had this talk last time, we, we, we came to the conclusion that happiness should be a KPI, whether it's developer happiness, product happiness, especially developer happiness, I think. That's probably the most important part of this whole conversation, but making your lives better and making people's lives better as a result. And so before we end, one more thing, uh, new exciting journey for in recovery. Well, not really for in recovery, more of an open source initiative. We haven't announced this yet, but it's coming out um, next week. Uh, we are launching addiction.ai. So this is going to be a work group that is going to be completely focused on how we can bring together healthcare providers, payers, these non-technical people, again, 
taking that same approach, academic researchers, AI experts, tech experts, tech companies, and actually creating a work group where we all talk together and we look at what solutions can actually be improved or can be brought out in the AI space. We're looking a lot at this concept of personal LLM so we can create at the, at, at the, at the end of one level personalization for people when it comes to their healthcare, their mental health care specifically, which is very, very important because we're all very different. If you look to your left or to your right, one in five Americans or you know, people in the entire world suffer from mental health disorders, whether it's addiction, whether it's um, depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, or more, it's, it's, it's real. And so what we're trying to do is uh, really har harness the, the, the power of people of, of, of experts, of, of panels of experts to see what direction we should head in with AI, talk about the ethics of it, talk about privacy, what, what should we do, how can we use AI to help people heal and thrive. So if you guys wanna join us, any of you, it's gonna be an open source work group, be happy to talk to you and happy to have you on board. And, and that's it, let's go make an impact together. And if you wanna you know, reach out, my email's there. And again, thank you so much for this conference. It's been such a great experience. Again, always good to see everybody from Apollo and all the familiar faces from the GraphQL community. And let's give it a round of applause again to the GraphQL community, to Apollo, and to all the speakers. Thank you.